Welcome to Bria. Glad you guys came out tonight. It's a beautiful night. I'm glad that we didn't get that hurricane or tropical storm or whatever we were supposed to get. Um, how many first timers do I have here tonight? All right, welcome guys. Um, listen, all of our corporates that you're hearing and the speakers that we have, uh, this, is our, this is our backbone to our club. Our information's on our website, but the best thing is, is that if you really want to get involved in real estate investing, get involved with the club, give us a call at the office. Uh, we'll schedule a meeting, come in, meet the rest of the team. My name is Ryan, I'm the president of Bria, uh, also known as the MC. Um, and then my partners, uh, Anish Dave and Robert Donahue, which are the two ball guys running around here, probably doing something, talking to people out there. Um, and then our ambassadors, Bill and Jam, which we thought were gonna be here tonight, but I don't think Bill's feeling too well, so. Um, anyways, um, we're the Broad Real Estate Investor Association. We're the only, um, it, it register with the national RIA for uh, Broward and Dade counties, which means a lot to our members. Uh, one of the things it means to our members is that we are now doing a cooperative with Home Depot. Has anybody ever heard of Home Depot? Little, little company. Um, we have a 2% cash back program now. If you become a member of RIA, it's 2% cash back. In the last six months, we just started the program and we haven't even been advertising it or pushing it. Um, we only have a few members that are even using it. We've given back over $40,000 to our members in the last six months alone. So that's huge. Okay, so um, that's one of our um, programs that we have going on. Also, um, our mentor program. Who in here is interested in getting into uh, and learning about real estate investing? A few of you? Yep. So if you're really wanting to become successful in real estate investing, you need to come talk to us. Uh, our mentor program is considered one of the top programs in the country. I'm going to be speaking, as I do every year, at the national conference uh, which this year is in, in, in Minneapolis in front of 250 RIAs in the country. And we speak specifically about our mentor program and what we're doing because we do a few things differently and we do a few things that no one else in this country is doing in their mentor programs. The number one thing that we do in our mentor program, we put up 100% of the money for our students. We put up 100% of the funds for our students. What that means is you find a deal and when you need to buy the deal, if it's a short sale, you need to hold on for 30 days or you need to market the property, even if it's a simultaneous closing where you're gonna do a same day closing or a longer hold, we partner with our students and we put up the money on those deals, okay? Um, in the last couple months, um, we, uh, and we met, I made an announcement at the last meeting, but we didn't include their second deal. Um, we have one of our, uh, two of our favorite students that uh, we talk about a lot of times because they're two of the students that are doing it, put the work in, follow the path that we lay out for them. And in the last two months, uh, the profits on their, uh, on their two deals collectively, these are wholesale deals that we're just flipping, $73,000. That's not too bad for a couple of wholesale flips, right? So in our mentor program, the other thing that we do very differently is it's a true one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Okay, I have students that are in here now. If you're interested in my program, when you're networking at these meetings, Find other students. So ask people if they're a student of the mentor program. How many students do I have of my mentor program in here right now? Raise your hands for me. Right? You can talk to any one of these people and they will let you know and, and, and tell you the dedication that we have and the one-on-one -on -one mentorship, meaning that a student of mine can call me on a Monday and say, hey, listen, Tuesday night, tomorrow at 8 o'clock, this homeowner wants to meet. They want to get started on a short sale, but they have some questions and I can't answer all their questions. Why don't you come with us? We go out to the house with our student. There's no other mentor program that does anything even remotely close to that, okay? So there's a lot of different things. I'm not gonna you know, bore you guys all night with our mentor program, but, um, but those are a few things, a few key features. So if you're really interested in becoming successful into, into uh, real estate investing, come in and talk with us, meet the rest of the team. Um, you're gonna have a, a, a team of, of mentors that are gonna be guiding you to the right path and putting up 100% of the funds while you're doing it. You can't beat that. Harold. Howard, sorry. Um, is everybody who goes through your program have no experience or are there people who have done real estate or so the level of experience in, in my mentor program, it, it varies. Um, but no, the majority of students that come into my mentor program don't know anything about really about real estate, which is great because on the one-on-one -on -one mentorship that we do, the first meeting that you have is with me. And I talk to you about your experience, your past. We get into the psychology of who you are, what you're gonna be representing when you go and speak to a homeowner. I've got a firefighter and his wife, and we're working on a marketing strategy right now. He's the firefighter investor. 
And all of his letters are going to be sent out with him, his wife, and his grandkids in front of the fire truck because people trust firefighters. So on a one-on-one -on -one mentorship in our program, we don't just fit every student in the same mold. Depending upon your experience, your level of experience in real estate or not, and what other experiences that you have, we help you capitalize on that, and we push your marketing and things in that. So again, if you're interested, come to our website, look us up, make an appointment, come in the office and talk to us. Um, all right, so a very important announcement. We have been in this space for 11 years. Um, unfortunately, the International Gaming and Fishing Hall of Fame is in the midst of moving to Chicago, of all places, I don't know why. Um, so we are actually gonna be moving spaces for a while. We may be coming back here, but at least we know for the next three months, and it will be all of our website, we'll put out the emails, so we'll let everybody know, but we just wanna let everybody know that the signature grand, uh, which is south of 595 east of University, a lot of people know where the signature grand is, um, that's where our meetings are gonna be at least for the next three months. The plan is hopefully in six months, we'll either be back here or we'll be in some other permanent space. So just to let everybody know, but we'll be making that announcement. So just make a mental, mental note. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be a few people next month that are gonna be showing up knocking on that door and no one's gonna be here, unfortunately. So Signature Grand is our new, um, our new location. Okay, so uh, if anybody has read our newsletter, last, uh, the last, last newsletter that we had, we had a story about the miracle workers, okay? And that was Independence Title. Um, Independence Title is one of our corporate members. They are one of the most investor-friendly title companies. They're very savvy. Their team is very good at what they do. We had a deal in um, uh, Miramar where we were doing a, a flip on a property. And we had actually already bought the property. So we did the A to B and we were looking to do the B to C. We had a buyer. He owned two properties on that same street. Because let me tell you, this wasn't the most beautiful property I've ever seen. Um, but we were making a $21,000 profit on this property. And we wanted to obviously keep the deal in motion. Uh, the Monday before the Tuesday, when we had the, when we were supposed to have the closing, um, we got a call and I was talking to, um, to, the, to the buyer and he said that he, his financing fell through. He was using hard money. And um, we talked to Independence Title and without even really asking them, Victor from Independence Title, literally the next day, already found a hard money lender. They got the deal closed and saved the deal. That's why we call them the Miracle Workers. So um, with over 12 years of experience, owning Independence Title since 2003, I want to introduce to you guys one of our favorite corporate members and one of our title guys, Kevin Tatch of Independence Title. Give him a great round of applause. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How's everyone doing? I'm just going to restart this so my timer is uh, current. All right. Well, it's good to see how many new people are here because I, I love when I come to these events because there's a lot of people that are, are looking to jump into the business. And we're going to cover a lot of stuff tonight. Okay. I'm going to ask you to hold all the questions till the end. And there's a reason because I've been doing this a long time and I pretty much cover most of the content that was advertised within my presentation. And at the end, if you have questions, my team is gonna stay here as long as you need to answer every question you have. We'll answer as many as we can in a public forum and then the rest we'll do uh, in the end. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me in the back? And just real quick, use this handheld for a minute. I wanna change that battery. Change that battery. Okay. Done? All right, so let me see, how, how many people are, are New in the business, not new here, but new in the business. You've never done a deal before. Okay, now lower your hands. How many people have done, let's say, five deals? Five deals, okay, and then 10 deals, 10 plus deals? Okay, so we have some seasons, but a lot of new people. Okay, so what I'm gonna do tonight is I'm gonna teach you the A to Z from a title company perspective, okay? The, the key component of a real estate transaction is having a good general contractor on your side, but most importantly, if you're looking to flip a deal, you're looking to wholesale real estate, which is where a lot of what I'm talking about tonight comes into play, you need an investor-friendly title company on your side. Would you all agree? Yes. Okay, so first I wanna thank you, thank Robert, Anish, all the guys, Robert, Bill and Jen, Ryan, Ryan thank all of you. Uh, it, it was a long time, we were trying to get into the club and get established, and, and we wanted to build the relationship. When I met with them, I told them, I said, it's not about the club members necessarily using me, it's about you guys having faith in my team and the trust of us doing deals. 
And finally, about six months ago, the door opened for us. We had that opportunity. We've closed several deals for them now. And, and we've shown our, our way. We show what we do best, which hopefully you'll get a little, little feeling of uh, this evening. So here's a picture. Many years ago, think of all of you guys as, as these penguins behind me. Do you see yourself up there? Yes? Do you see yourself up there? Okay, so on the hill. The reason I share this is because in, in this business, we have 200 people sitting in this room, and you're all sitting there watching, okay? And there's always going to be one of you that's going to walk up to the edge and be scared as hell to look in that water, because what's in that water waiting for you? An orca ready to eat you, right? There's something ready to eat you, and you're all doing it, every single one of you, whether you're in the mentoring program, you've never done a deal, you're waddling up and you're looking, and every single one of you are doing the same thing, like, I'm not going in there. Many years ago, I had the opportunity where I was faced with the same thing. The business was horrible. And I was faced with the same thing of walking up, but guess what I did different? I jumped in. And when I jumped in, what happened? There was no orca. That's just what was in your head. The fear factor is what scared me from jumping in. So I want all of you tonight to really to take as much notes as you can. I'm going to educate you a lot. I'm going to hopefully motivate you a little bit and inspire you to leave here and do something different than you did yesterday. Tomorrow is a new day. You do something different to get into this business and make a lot of money. I met several of you that are new here, and a lot of you said, I just want to learn what to do. I want to learn how to make money. I've never done a deal, but I want to know how to do it. And that's what we're going to share hopefully tonight with you. I'm going to give you a little history about myself. I moved down here uh, 2001, August 20th. I was a firefighter up in New York, so that's why I have this picture. I moved down here August 20th of 2001. So I'm sure you understand what happened a few days later, that I was blessed enough to get out in time. I was not in the city. I was just outside of the city, but my, my trucks were there. And one of the reasons I like to share this is because... What I implemented over the last few years with my team is making sure that there's really one philosophy that I learned from when I first became a firefighter, and that was we go in the deal together and we leave the deal together, right? That's what firefighters do very well. They go in the fire together, but they never leave anyone behind. And I'll never forget there was one fire I walked into and I got stuck, my boot got stuck up on a, a wrought iron gate that was at the top of the steps, and I couldn't get it undone. I started hyperventilating and I was scared because this fire was starting to roll over my head. And there was one guy, I'll never forget, stayed there with me and helped me cut that away and get down the steps and out the front of the house. So we figured out implementing into this business, because it was very difficult for me to go from being a firefighter to sitting behind a desk. I'm sure you can imagine, right? It's, it's, it's like, it's a total shock. So I said, this is what we need to do differently in our business. And that's one of the things that we do. We will stand by you regardless. We will get you out of that deal and get you paid. That's our number one reason for doing these deals. A little bit about my hobbies. I do anything with water. The one thing I hate is heights. And my, my wife convinced me to fly in that plane. I went and I was actually flying the plane. It was the most amazing experience. But I love to do anything to do with water. It's one of my passions. Charity is also a huge, you know, as Ryan said, they give that 2% back. You know, this is one of the things that we do. We give back so much to charity. One of our, our larger charities is LifeNet for Families, which is a soup kitchen right on Broward Boulevard, literally right down the street, Broward and, and 33rd. Uh, we do so much for getting involved in the community, and I hope you do as well, because that's what's going to help take your business to the next level. If you do a deal and you give a little bit back to charity, it could be your time, it could be your money. You don't have to be rich. You just have to care. You have to care more about the cause and, and helping others. This is my wife and my daughter, Lindsay. You know, some of you, how many of you are here with your spouses? So some of you, congratulations. You know, it, it's very important. You know, my business was going, there, there were many times, my staff will tell you, where we were doing three deals, five deals, 10 deals a month, three deals a month. You know, and, and when I met my wife at a convention very similar to this, she was involved in the industry and understood it. One of the things that helped me take the business to the next level is having a spouse that understands the business understands to support you. So you need to make sure you're bringing your spouses, your significant others to events like this. Because it's important for them to see and buy into what you're doing. Because if you've never done a deal and you're working a nine to five job, as soon as you go home, they're gonna say, you can't give up your job and do this. And you're gonna say, but there was that group up here and they made $60,000 on one deal and I don't make $60,000 in two years. So I need to give up my job and do it. 
So you need to make sure you have someone that supports you. It's very, very, very important. I am an Amazon.com best-selling author. How many of you have heard of Ron Legrand? So a good bunch of you. So Ron Legrand and I, we wrote a book called Sold. I've written a few others. On our website, titlerate.com, which you see at the bottom, you will see on there, it's uh, all of our downloads. You can download all of our books on there. You do not need to buy them. I will tell you, if you buy them, the proceeds all go to charity. So if you want to feel charitable, you can buy the book on Amazon and have a hard copy. But if not, you could just download the PDF online and read it. And we wrote these books with, with one premise. It was to educate you. Educate you as much as we can so you don't make the same mistakes that we've made over the years. Educate you everything that we learned about these deals. So one rule, and I see some of you recording this, which is fine. If you want to record it, it's fine. They're going to record a video and put it on the website. I just have one rule that everyone understands. I'm not a real estate attorney. Does everyone understand that? If you want legal advice, this isn't the presentation for you, and I tell you that because I'm gonna give you a lot of my criteria and, and history of doing this, but I'm not an attorney. But I've been doing this a long time, and I'm gonna give you a lot of information. But if you want the legal opinion, consult with your attorney, consult with your CPA, consult with your financial advisor. Everyone get it? Let me hear you say yes. yes. Awesome. So I'm what's called a licensed title agent. I've been doing this a long time, since 2003. I started processing deals myself and eventually built it up to owning the company. When I first started, I was in the mortgage business. I owned a real estate company, so I understand, and that's one of the unique things about our company, different from any other title company in the industry. We understand, if you're a realtor, we understand you. If you're a mortgage broker, we understand you. If you're a hard money lender, we understand you. What do you all want to do? Get in, get out, and what? Get paid, right? You want to get in, get out, and get paid. That's what you're looking to do. So, so many of these title companies, I was talking to someone today, where's, I think Steve was here, I don't know if he's still in the room, one of our investors. He was just telling me, he was on the phone with us, the deal, trying to structure it, and the attorney's trying to kill the deal for his investor that's bought a ton of properties because he couldn't understand how double closings work. And he's trying to kill the deal. So that's one of the things. It's all about getting, get out, get paid, because we don't get paid until you what? Close, right? We don't get paid until you close. So that's the important part. So we have that experience to understand all facets of the transaction. We were rated top 10 with our insurance underwriter. Actually, we were ranked, this was last year, we were ranked number nine in the entire state of Florida. Number nine for the most premium, number nine for the best escrow reconciliations in the entire state for our national underwriter. It's a very, very good thing to understand. And when we talk about deposits, you'll learn why. This is my team. We have a lot of them. Some of them are here tonight. We have Tracy, Mark, and Alex on top. That's my management team. Stephanie, Tanisha, Jackie, Victor, Iris, Kay, Yovel is our, one of our marketing guys. We have uh, Suzanne and Stacy. They do some of our processing and, and marketing as well. Suzanne's here. They're going to come up and down with a bowl. Uh, I think Victor has the bowl. He's going to come up and down. If you want to win a couple of drawings, we're going to give away a few bottles of wine. And at the end of the night, I need three people that really enjoyed the presentation that want to give a testimonial, video testimonial in front of the step and repeat we have out there. And you can get a bottle of wine, a nice bottle of red wine like this. So after the first three that go out there, they have it. And they'll be filming it once the presentation's over. You know, you need to have the best support team. If you don't have a good support team, nothing's going to happen. Same thing with you. You need the best support team. If you think I don't understand what you're doing, I understand it. These are the homes, most of these I have owned, I've sold off a lot, but I've understand buying crappy houses, buying 900 square foot CDS homes and renting them out for 6.25 a month when business was bad, that was my business model that I started doing. And so I understand, I get what you're doing, I, I understand this business, so when you have questions, hopefully we'll be able to answer them for you. On our website, you can download our closing cost calculator. We have it for mobile app and, and uh, for Apple and Android as well. You can go online, it's very simple. I won't bore you with it. But in about 30 seconds, you can calculate closing costs. Why is that important? We'll talk about it in a few minutes. All right, so now let's get into the education. You have a notepad, so take as many notes as you like. And again, any questions, I'll answer after. So what is title insurance? Everyone, I did a, a flip nerd interview the other day, and, and there was a guy on there who says, well, thousands of properties. He has no clue what title insurance really even is or why is it useful. Title insurance is just like any other insurance policy. What kind of insurance do you have out there? Car, life, health, 
homeowners, right? Now, let me ask you a question though. What are those insurances insuring? Right, what is car insurance insuring? That you're gonna what, leave here and what? Not crash, right? But can they see if you're gonna crash or not? Okay. What about health insurance? Let's take health insurance. What does health insurance do? Any expenses for going to the doctor, the hospital, you get sick? Do they know if you're going to get sick? No. So you pay it how often? Monthly. Residual, right? Every month, every year, every six months. Title insurance is different, okay? Title insurance is because you buy it today, and we can see everything that we're insuring. We can see all the liens, we can see all the mortgages, we can see all the judgments, we can see all the federal tax liens, all the homeowners association violations, all the mortgage payouts. We can see what we're insuring. So that's why the premium is a one-time premium for you, the owner, and you never pay it again. So it's not an annual, um, not an annual expense, because we protect reverse, that nobody behind you buying is gonna purchase the property. So if you were to buy a property and someone slapped a lien against it next week, title insurance doesn't cover that. We cover from the time you're purchasing backwards in time. Clear and marketable is a term you're gonna hear a lot of people when you're buying at the courthouse and stuff. A lot of times when you're buying tax deed sales and things like that, you're gonna hear titles clear, but not marketable, which means you're gonna have a problem getting title insurance. Okay? A lot of these tax deed sales are not marketable and not insurable until you do a quiet title suit, which is a whole nother presentation. Um, but understand that you want to make sure if you ever see in an MLS listing, you're getting clear title but not marketable, you want to make sure you, you ask the question why. Permits are a number one important thing that is not covered in title insurance. Write that down. If you're buying bank-owned properties, a lot of them are not pulling permit searches. Why is it important? I'm going to tell you a story. One of our investors bought a property with an expired permit from years ago. Okay? Permit was expired. No big deal. Bought it. Title company didn't even let them know. Why? Because it's not covered. They didn't have an obligation to let them know there was an open or an expired permit. So he closed, fixed up the property, and now went to resell it to an FHA buyer. What did that title company do? Pull, check permits, right? We check permits. They don't check it because they don't want to kill the deal, most of these title companies. So we check the permit. You find out that there's an expired permit. What do you have to do? Close it. So it means you either have to open it and close it, open it, get an engineer's letter and close it, or worse, in this case, open it, replace the entire roof because it wasn't done to code, and now close it. Whose profit does that cut into? So guys, if you're buying bank-owned properties, make sure they're pulling a permit search for not only open permits, but expired permits and closed permits. So you can see the transaction history of what was done on the property. You don't want to put yourself in that situation because that's going to cut into your profit big time. Code violations is another big one. How many of you have seen code violations on properties? What are the amounts daily with code violations? Right? Code violations, guess what, are not covered in title insurance. Liens, if it's a lien, it's covered. If it's just a violation and accruing fines and stuff, it's not covered in title insurance. It's, a lot of times it's not recorded in public record. So again, what is these REO title companies? What do they not do? They don't look, they don't care. Because who's their client? You or the bank? The bank. Shame on them because that's not the case, guys. You are the client. They're, they're just a third party that's in the middle of this transaction, is all they are. They have an obligation to represent both sides equally. But the problem is, is it's not covered in title insurance, so they don't check it. I know a very well-known attorney who represented underwriters for many years, and she represents sellers now, buying at the courthouse. She does not pull lien searches at all on any of her closings. Because her client picks title, her client's the seller, and there's no obligation to pull a lien search on a closing. Okay? How scary is that of the things that can come up? You have to be very, very, very careful. They issue two types of policies, so we protect the owner and the lender. So people ask, well, if I'm refinancing a property, why do I need to buy title insurance again? You're not. It's your lender that's buying it. When you take out a new loan, let's say three years later, why? What are they checking? What period of time? The last three years, from the time they're taking out a new loan to make sure you didn't do anything with the property from the time you bought it. 
Very important. And it doesn't cover a lot of things, which we spoke about. Again, I was pretty clear on that. One of the questions, which box do I check? If you're doing short sales and stuff, which box do I check? I always wonder why in Broward County, people ask me, which one do I check when it says Miami-Dade Broward Regional Provisional? If it says Miami-Dade Broward, which box do you think you should check? Right? You laugh, but I'm telling you how many times they don't. There are differences between different boxes that are checked. Some boxes means the buyer is going to pay more. Some boxes mean the buyer is going to pay less in closing costs. Okay? And you can read it. It explains all the different ones. The most important one is the first one where it says seller shall designate closing agent. Okay? So that you need to understand. If you want control of your deal, I don't care if the bank's saying you have to use our title company. You say no. I'm paying for title insurance, I'm picking my title company, or I'm not buying the property. Now, does that work every time? No. Is it working more and more now? Yes, because you remember the whole robo-signing with David Stern and all those companies, how all of a sudden, after they got, all, they got caught, magically all the banks stopped directing the title insurance because they didn't want you to use their company because they didn't know what was going on. So you need to be careful. Always pick. Check the box that you're picking and you're paying and nine out of ten times, your costs are going to be less, because we'll cover that. The REO title companies charge a lot of money. All right, escrow dis disputes are big business nowadays. If you are not clear with how your contract is written, escrow disputes are a big one. They're taking people's deposits. I have one of a, a very well-known wholesaler right now who has a $7,000 deposit at risk. That the buyer's saying, the, buy the seller and the seller's agent are saying, we want your deposit. And the title company is not allowed to release it. So if you have a, a deposit up and the buyer or, or the, and the seller comes to me because you're the buyer and the seller comes to say, nope, I'm putting a claim to that deposit. Guess what I'm not allowed to do? By law, I'm not allowed to return the deposit if there's a dispute without either a signed release or a court order releasing that. Okay, so understand when your money's at risk, you need to know your ways out. So first thing is effective date and counting the days. Make sure you take the effective date of the contract, which is when? Last person signed the contract, right? That's the effective date. And then counting days could be calendar days and could be business days. You need to know both, okay? You need to know your inspection period. When should you cancel a contract? If you're wholesaling, the whole premise of wholesaling real estate is buying it and selling it within your inspection period with a deposit bigger than yours. So if you lose your deposit, they lose their deposit, and at least you walk away whole if not making a few dollars, right? That's the premise of wholesaling real estate. So you need to understand that if you don't cancel by the time your inspection period's up, guess what happens to your deposit? It goes hard. Guess what you lose? Your money if you don't close. So in the case of, the, like Maria was saying, with the deal that we saved for them, because we found the lender, that buyer could have technically lost their deposit if they didn't close because their lender fell through. So you need to be careful counting your days in the contract, right? You need to be very careful. Some of these deposits are five or 10%. It's important. Code and permit check, again, we spoke about. You need to know that code and permit, the contract, the new FAR bar as is contract, says the permits and the code enforcement, municipal, code enforcement utilities must be checked when? What is it usually checked now? Before closing, right? You usually get a clear permit check. The new contract says you need to have it done within your inspection period. Did anyone know that? Okay. So most people don't know that. The new contract, so there's a clause you can email our office and we'll send you that says your inspection period covers everything with the exception of those items. And the seller's responsible for correcting those items. But if it's not in your contract, the bank or the seller's attorney is going to come to you and say, you should have checked for code and permit in your inspection period. And since you didn't, you can't cancel the contract because there's an expired permit. Very, very, very important. It's a horrible change that they made to the contract. And hopefully the new one will address that. That's in the as is. Financing contingency. It's important. You have an FHA buyer, they're getting financing, right? You get your pre-approval letter. How many get pre-approval letters from a buyer? Okay? Pre-approval letters aren't worth the paper it's written on. Okay? Not worth the paper it's written on. You need to get an underwriting approval. 
They can run it. Any mortgage broker can run it through their underwriting system and get a preliminary approval. I would never accept a contract without that. Pre-approval letters are garbage, okay? And I've been doing this a long time. I owned a mortgage company, so I know. I used to have really fancy pre-approval letters. They're garbage. We would type it up. We'd look at credit and income. Great. You need to run it through the system. It takes them maybe an hour, and they get you what's called a desktop underwriter approval, especially with, with FHA buyers. You need to make sure they are approved. Now, your financing contingency says 30 days, right? That's typical. The contract says 30 days. You can do it less, but it says 30 days. What happens on day 31 if they do not provide you your financing commitment letter? They lose their deposit, right? How many of you think they lose their deposit, right? It's after 31 days. They don't provide it. They lose their deposit. Anyone? No. They don't lose their deposit. It extends until either party cancels, and it's very important. Most people think it just goes away. If they don't provide it, it's expired. That was their chance to get out, and now they can't. You need to make sure that you as a seller go to that buyer and say, you need to provide the loan commitment, waiving your financing contingency, or I'm canceling the contract. Okay? Because it does not automatically go away. Very, very important. And everything must be what? In? Let's hear that again. Everything must be in? Writing. Writing. It's very, very, very important. Victor, did you get some business cards? If you just go up, you got them? Okay, so they're going to collect the business cards for the raffle. All right, so let's talk about some different types of searches that we do. We covered lean searches. So this is lean searches. It says it's everything that's what? Not recorded, right? What's not recorded? Code enforcement. Violations. Permits. Utility bills. How many of you have seen large utility bills? Who wants to go head to head with me? How much have you seen? Three thousand. I know the deal. I closed that deal. They, you win. You win. I closed. Did you hear that, guys? Seventeen thousand dollars in water bills. So what happens if an REO title company doesn't pull a utility search and you close on the property? What did, and you go to turn on the water, what did you just buy? $17,000 bill. Can it be mitigated? Yes, I think that one got down to nine, ten, nine or 10,000. 99 and change. So only 10,000, 10,000 is a lot of money, guys. So again, that's everything that's not recorded. Then you have our title search. How many of you have gone to the public record and you search Broward County or Palm Beach public records? That's what you can search, it's indexed by Legal description. Okay, Susanna uh, is collecting business cards. If you want to get into the raffle, you can. We'll pick some bottles of wine at the end. Okay, so it's everything that's recorded. Everything that's tied to the legal description or the owner's name. It could be liens. It could be divorces. It could be bankruptcies. It could be judgments. It could be HOA liens, deeds, mortgages, federal tax liens. Every, anything that's recorded in public record will be in, in public records on the title search. We check a tax search. How many of you have been to the tax collector's site? Only a few of you. So you can search property taxes on the website. If you own a house, you can go on there, you can search it, you can pay it. I will tell you that the tax collector's site is garbage. You want to know how I know? I'll give you 10,000 reasons why I know. Just equate that to dollars. Okay? We did a closing in Palm Beach where we searched the tax collector's site and it said two years of back taxes were due. Okay? It was an REO property. Two years of back taxes were due. We called the tax collector and we said, we need a payoff amount. They said, you know what? There's nothing due. Our website is wrong. We searched it. I said, well, I'm not going to rely on, on a clerk telling me this, that they're not due, because your website says it's due, right? So we said, can you send it to us in writing? Dear title agent, we've researched parcel number so-and-so. Our website is unreliable. There are no taxes due on this parcel. Two years back taxes. So client purchased the property and then got a notice a year later for what's called a tax deed sale. Someone applied for those two years taxes to buy their property and take it from them. But we have the letter. When we called the tax collector, what did they say? Oops, we made a mistake, but pay them anyway. And if you don't believe me, just go on our website or YouTube, and, and that's where you see the NBC logo. We were on NBC with that story with the tax collector. 
basically the head attorney for Ann Gannon in Palm Beach called us and said, listen, we were wrong, but I can't pay taxpayers dollars to make our mistake right. You have to sue me. Is it worth it for me to sue? Probably not. It's just going to cost me more than the 10 grand in, in legal fees to, to defend it. So it's not reliable. So if you are going to check on the website, call and verify to make sure whether taxes are paid or not paid. And hopefully, if you get two of the same answers, hopefully it's right. But if it's not right, what happens? The title company stuck with it. Same thing with the mortgage. We paid a mortgage off last month for a client. We're doing a closing, we paid a mortgage off, and the mortgage payoff letter gave the amount good through the end of the month. We paid it, we closed the deal, and all of a sudden I get the wire back. What's that, you guys? Oh my goodness, so good. See, it's their fault. We get the payoff money back, and we call the lender and we ask them why. And they say, well, we added fees. There was something missing. You added fees. You gave us an approval letter good through the end of the month. Well, so on the bottom of the approval letter, it says they're deemed reliable but not guaranteed. So who had to pay the difference in the mortgage payoff? Me. Okay? Now you understand why you need an investor-friendly title company, someone who's going to look out for your best interest. Not a company closing five or ten deals a month. They are not able to pay these claims uh, when they come up. Do you think title insurance would have covered that? Maybe. How long would it take to get paid? Probably a while. So title insurance is good, you need it, but it's not always going to jump in and pay those claims immediate when you get a, a tax deed. Someone's going to take your house from under you. And then we check an OFAC search, which is checking money laundering, terrorism, and things of that nature. So, we write, so if I ever call you and say, hey, I need your date of birth, or I need your you know, middle name, it's because you, you were hit on the OFAC list, and we need to put some more information. A lot of common names get picked up on that, and then we need to provide more information because uh, they're on some type of watch list. Title insurance policies. So we consist of a title commitment. How many of you have ever received a title commitment? So some of you. The title company is supposed to give the buyer a title commitment within five days of closing. I hope my staff does it. I'm assuming they do. But yes, you're supposed to send it within five days of closing. That is your guarantee that they're insuring property. Another investor bought a property and didn't have their title commitment, and all of a sudden the second mortgage, the title company never paid it off. They needed the money for their payroll. Okay? And a lot of you are laughing. This is true, I, I swear. They never paid the second mortgage off. They thought they were going to roll it, maybe make a payment, and then pay it next month. Then they eventually went out of business, and this guy was stuck with the lender saying foreclosing on the property. And he came to me and said, well, what do I do? I said, well, do you have a title commitment? Because you can go to the underwriter and they'll pay it. He says, no, I, I don't. I don't even know who insured it, and the title company's out of business. So he was stuck without knowing who the underwriter was. Very, very important. You need to get a copy of your title commitment at closing. So we talked about the types of policies. And when you leave closing, there's something called a marked up title commitment that you want to get. Very few people ask for it. That's where the title company crosses off all of the requirements to make sure they're giving you clear title. That that's their binder. How many of you would drive a car without a binder from your insurance company? Anyone? You, you wouldn't leave, right? You buy a car, you get a, a temporary insurance card. That's your temporary insurance card. If you leave closing without it, you could have a major problem. And we call banks, title companies all the time and ask for it. What do they tell us? A what? We say, a marked up title commitment. Oh no, we don't do those. Well, no, you will do it. Go to your under, find somebody, and then you get it. Because they don't understand it. Most people don't ask for it. So you never want to leave without the marked up title commitment. Very, very important. All right, let's talk about some of the custom charges. Realtor commissions, right? You have realtor commissions. How about that transaction fee that real estate agents charge? It could be anywhere I've seen from 195 to 1250. So if you didn't know you had it, it's going to cut into your profit. Know what charges are being charged by the people involved in the deal. Lenders charges, if you're getting a hard money loan, we do a lot of closings with Equity Max, you need to make sure you're getting all of your charges. What, what are they charging? How many points? How much processing fees? So you know what the deal is. You know what your charges are. Transactional funding. How many of you use transactional funding? That's when you're buying and flipping real estate. We provide that for you if you do the closing with us. So we arrange it for you. Yes, there's a fee, it's not free money, 
But if you can't close cash on the, for, with the, the bank's title company because you're flipping a deal, we can get the money arranged for you to close it. It's one of our services that we provide for you with our investor. And there's no 24 to 48 hours waiting and you have to do a mortgage and a note. We just make a phone call, money's wired out to the bank, and then we wire you your profit and wire the investor back their money. Very simple process. Lead search and title search, again, those charges you need to know if you're paying for it. Owner's title insurance, surveys, I always recommend getting a survey. Most investors don't. Uh, again, I tell you the war stories. I have an owner that purchased a property, an investor, cash, didn't get a survey. The owner that was foreclosed, he bought it at an REO, the bank foreclosed on the property. It was two lots. The pool was on the back lot. The foreclosed mortgage was only recorded on the front lot. They foreclosed on the front lot. The bank took the property back and sold it to our investor with the front lot only. The owner came back two years later and said, get out of my pool or pay me $30,000. Did he have a valid claim? The owner, the old owner? Does the current owner have a valid fight? Nope, why? He didn't get a survey. The foreclosed mortgage was only on the front property. Nobody knew. So there's a perfect example why you should get a survey. REO title company charges are generally much higher. They charge buyers five, six, seven hundred dollars to close, sometimes fifteen hundred dollars to close a transaction, a cash transaction as a buyer. They charge you attorney's fees. So our response when we're shadowing the second closing is always have your attorney provide us the retainer agreement that my client hired you to represent them instead of just closing the deal. Okay, we'll remove it. See, they're gonna try anything they can to make some money. I'm telling you, you have to be very careful. And settlement charges, ours are pretty much the lowest in the business. $250 for a seller doesn't get any lower than that. We can barely make payroll on $250, which is why we do volume. We're closing close to 100 deals a month. And doc stamps, now this is the important one. Wholesaling, you have to make sure your contracts, very important, write this down, your contracts mirror image each other. So if you are paying, a lot of these Fannie Mae deals, you as the buyer have to pay the seller's doc stamps, right? When you're selling, what should you make sure your buyer does? Pays your doc stamps, why? If not, what does it cut into? Your profit, right? It cuts into your profit. How many of you wanna get paid? Okay? I'll tell you investors that have walked out of the deal having to pay money just to save face with their investor and they lost money on a deal because they didn't realize their student didn't know this. So that's why it's important working with a mentor like, like the guys from Bria so they know to look out for these things. What are you paying for on the buy? We make sure the buyer pays for it on the sell. You're not getting double dipped or you're not gonna pay title insurance on the buy and title insurance on the sell unless it's a big enough profit and it makes sense to have those additional costs, right? Couple of deeds you're gonna see, warranty deed. Warranty deed is when you as an owner are living in the property selling, okay? That's a warranty deed. The second deed is a what's called a special warranty deed. You're gonna see a special warranty deed. The only thing that makes it special is the owner didn't live in the property. It's either an investment property or it's a, a bank owned property. It means that it's not an owner occupied sale. That's what special warranty deed means, okay? So if you're buying from a bank, and you're buying it with a special warranty deed, what should you be selling it with? What does the contract standard say? A lot of times warranty deed. So the problem is, is you're giving those warrants when you're selling, but when you're receiving it, you're not. Very important to read your contract. If you're getting it via special warranty deed and you're flipping it, make sure you just add a clause in there that says, seller will deed the property via a special warranty deed. Very simple. Trustees deed you see a lot for probate. For new investors, probate deals are a huge way for you to make money, huge, when you're dealing with probate deals, okay? Probate deals is where you find a distressed family that lost a loved one and is very, very distraught, and all they wanna do is get rid of the property, okay? It's a very simple process. They say, I want X amount of money and just get me out. I don't wanna deal with my siblings, we just want out. And they generally have a number. And that number generally leaves you a lot of profit. Okay? So that's where then you can make a lot. I've seen 60, 70 grand on a flip. You've owned the property one minute, you've made 60 grand. Not a bad profit 
for just helping a family that's in crisis get out of their deal and offer them a cash offer. Makes sense, right? And the scary one, anyone know what that picture is of? Brooklyn. You probably have one of these, we'll give you another one, catch. The Brooklyn Bridge. Now, can I deed you the Brooklyn Bridge? Yes. I can. Can I deed you this building? Why? Because what am I giving you with the quick claim deed? My interest. What's my interest in the Brooklyn Bridge if I deed it to you? Well, you don't know that, but would you bank on it? Maybe if I found sound sophisticated enough, and I say, you know what, give me 10 grand, I'm gonna deed you that 100th interest I have, and it makes sense to you, you do it. That's what happens all the time. Search the MLS and see how many deals say property will be deeded via quick claim deed. That means that seller does, may, may not own it, or there may be title defects, and they're just gonna give it to you for whatever price you pay. When is a quick claim deed okay? Divorce. Husband and wife, a divorce? Adding family members on? Deeding to a family trust, maybe, for, for estate planning purposes? So there are reasons for it, but in a traditional real estate closing, stay as far away from quick claim deed properties as you can. If you go to an owner and they say, you know what, I have a $100,000 mortgage, just take over my payments and I'll deed you the property, give me five grand, you may say, okay. That, that's one time when it may be done. But if you're buying bank owned properties and they're doing it via a, a quick claim deed and they foreclosed on it, there's typically a reason. There's something out there that they don't want to give you what from the first deed that's listed. Any warranty, right? They don't want to warrant the title. They just want to give it to you and give them their money. Make sense? Okay, so we talked about this already, and we're gonna get into the hot topic in a minute, which is land trust, but the seller of the bank's title company, they do not what? Represent you, right? We spoke about that. They represent their largest and best client, okay? They don't close without what's called a hold harmless agreement, which means close the deal and do not come back to me for anything that may come up. Does that make sense? Does that seem fair? Right? It doesn't seem fair that you're going to buy a deal and if a problem comes up like taxes are due or there's an open water bill, they're not going to correct it. Very, very, very scary. They do not disclose title defects. That's a big important one. As much as it's scary, it's scary. we have a, a, a wholesaler that bought a property and he needed to close quick. And we didn't have time to pull our backup search to double check their work and he closed cash. One underwriter, the same underwriter they did and we did, so we figured if theirs is clean, the chances that ours will be clean will probably be good. What was it? Not clean, same underwriter. Dirty title. We went back to them and said, hey, by the way, look at the stuff we found, and they said, oops. Okay, they don't disclose title defects. They remove things that may be so minor that they don't care about that could come back and bite you when you sell to your FHA buyer. Very important to make sure you're getting someone to pull a backup search. If we're doing the flip, we pull a backup search. If you're not doing a flip, you need an attorney to pull a backup search to check your work. Just hold the questions till the end because I'm on a time uh, crunch. They don't order permit searches, which we talk about. They do not understand you. If you go to a bank that's selling, the bank's title company, say, I'm gonna flip this deal. Can you handle the second side to save on costs? What are they gonna do? find every reason they can cancel the contract because they believe it's not allowed. You can't flip real estate. How many think you cannot flip real estate in, in Florida? Okay, you can. In Canada, where my wife's from, you have to actually hold real estate for a certain period of time. I don't know if it's 30 days or longer, but you have to actually buy it, hold it before you can sell it. In Florida, fair game, guys. You have to own it for one minute and we make sure we, we watch that for you. They do not allow double closings, which again, we spoke about, and they don't have lower fees. We spoke about the fees, $1,500. There are title companies that we take deals all of the time, because our closing fee was 250 and theirs was 1500 And it's cheaper for them to pay title insurance at 500 plus our $250 closing fee than their $1,500 closing fee plus title insurance. See why it makes sense a lot of times where you just do all your closings in one place and you don't have to worry about it. You know we're looking out for you. E-recording is a big one now. 
where we can electronically record the deed. How many of you have bought a property from a bank and waited an extensive period of time for the deed to get recorded? Has anyone done that? How long? Three weeks? That's actually fast. Anyone else? Tracy, is Tracy here still? What's our, how long have we waited for a deed to be recorded in Palm Beach with a bank? In Palm Beach, well over 30 days. 40 well over 30 days. So what does that cut into? Your seasoning requirements, you to sell to an FHA buyer because when they do the title search and pull the appraisal, you're not the owner of record. E-recording is very, very, very unique. I can basically close a deal today, record it today, and it's on public record today. Okay? Most title companies can't do it for the reason that they don't want to be bothered with it because there's a lot of financing behind it. I have one person that handles that all day long to get these documents recorded. So a lot of title companies aren't doing it. They're FedExing them. We've been called by Palm Beach County finding a deed that they said was at the bottom of a closet. The FedEx was at the bottom of a closet before they started e-recording. Okay? Okeechobee County, we had another one where we finally had to send a new mortgage to Israel to get recorded, to get signed and sent back because they lost it. And when, is the day we got the, the new document back from the client in Israel, the originals came to us, back from the county. They were lost somewhere. So you have to be careful. E-recording makes it so much easier. It's simple, it's fast, recording is immediate. Closes that gap. So if you're buying and you want to sell to an FHA buyer, you may need 30 days, 60 days, 90 days seasoning. Or they say we need to see you of record before you can sell to that buyer. That's what e-recording uh, does for you. Allows for faster seasoning, we spoke about it. And discrepancies very fast. Guys, this is a business. Do you think people make mistakes? Do you think my staff makes mistakes? Probably, yeah, mistakes happen. Where maybe we, we missed something on a deed that was missing a witness, things happen. We locate the discrepancy, we get it fixed immediately. Very important in first waiting 30 days for the deed to be recorded, 30 days for them to send it back with the discrepancy, another 30 days for them to fix it. As opposed to three days. Cuts that time uh, crunch down. All right, double closings and flips. How many of you want to flip real estate? Because you don't need any money, right? You don't need any credit. What do you need? Time. What else? Desire. Talent. Who said talent? Did someone say talent? Oh, so you don't need talent. You just need someone to show you the ropes. You need a mentor to show you the ropes. You just need time, right? You need time to find the deals. You don't need any money. And you need a buyer. Well, where do you find a buyer? Here. Where else do you find a buyer? Bria. Not me. But Bria. Right? Bria has a buyer's list. You send them the deal. They, they work out a split with you, whatever that is, if you're a student. So they have buyers. Other wholesalers have buyers. You come to clubs like this, there are buyers. So again, double closings and flips are the easiest way for all of you new investors, which is probably three quarters of the room, to make a lot of money. Two, three, four grand per deal. Do one or two of those a month part time. You made yourself more money than most make in a year. So double closings and flips are never done at the bank's title company. They will not do it. They will cancel your deal. They will say, we can't do it. We don't understand it. And most importantly, it's illegal. That's what they say. It's illegal. You can't flip it, which is not true. You do have two sets of closing costs. That's the downside. Assignment of contracts are great. Assignment of contracts are much better. But face it, bank's contracts are not what? Assignable. They're not assignable. So you need two sets of closing costs. They have to be closed simultaneously because do you want to own that property? If I'm putting up the money for you, do I want you to own that property? Absolutely not. I don't want to get a call from my staff saying, by the way, you just bought a property. And worse, I didn't buy the property, I bought the mortgage on the property because you're buying the property. So it's very important to make sure these deals are done simultaneously, which is where an investor-friendly title company comes into play to make sure they're lining up that end buyer and the secret sauce to the deal is that we close the second side first. We make sure we have the signed docs, we make sure we have their authorization to close, and we make sure that we get their money via wire, not checks anymore. Checks are no good in this business. Wire transfer only. So once I have the wire, once I have the signed documents, and I have their authorization to close it, we then fund the front side and hopefully everything is finished 
fairly fast and the bank records their deed quick. Title company must be investor friendly. Hard money lenders love it. So those of you who think you can't buy a flip and have a lender lend on it, hard money lenders love it all day long. And closing B assumes all the risk, which is us. We're doing it. We need to make sure we're following everything that's going on in the deal to make sure we're not putting our money at risk and your property at risk because you don't want to find out that the deal didn't close. Do deals ever get reversed? Absolutely, it happens. Deals get reversed last minute for all sorts of reasons. And we use use reporting with it. Transactional funding we spoke about is use when flipping a deal, right? Last piece of the puzzle, cost for funding range. If you have a mentor, they may fund it for you. We can fund it as well. The fees range from, I think, 750 up to 2% of the funding amount, depending on, on who's funding it and, and how much it is. Flash funding is what it's called. It's used when you're closing at two title companies, right? So you're closing deal A and deal B. You need to close cash. You can't use the end buyer's money to fund the front side. If you have someone that does that, and I know they do, it's illegal. You can't do it. Underwriting guidelines do not allow you to use the end buyer's money. You have to fund it cash as if you can close that deal with no regard to that second transaction. So you need to close it cash. That's where we come into play. We can get that money lined up for you. And it does not require a mortgage, a note, or credit. Right? So you have no financial obligation. You bring a contract, you get it closed, we do both closings, we fund it. Have a nice day. There's no mortgage, there's no note, there's no financial obligation. All you do is cash the what? Right? Make sense? Everyone with me? Huh? Or you get a wire. Yeah. Many title companies won't even wire. We wire real estate commissions to agents. We wire anything. We don't care. It's safer for us and less accounting. We follow up on more checks that never get cash. That it's, it's a headache. Yeah. So we, we love wire transfers. Code violations and building permits. So we talked about utility bills can become liens when they get excessive. Permits are not covered in title insurance. Code violations accrue daily fines. I think we talked about most of this. Code liens can be mitigated. Just like utility bills, they mitigated 17,000 down to 9,000. I've seen 350,000 mitigated to 3,500. What did you guys mitigate down to on that one? It was a lot. It wasn't the mortgage, actually. No, there was a city. city, city They made, yeah. So, you know, perfect example. You can mitigate these fines. So when you see them, don't get scared. You can mitigate with the city. Close your windows when rehabbing. If you're rehabbing properties, how do I know this? Code enforcement walks. They look in the windows and see something that they don't like that you needed a permit for, whatever. Close your windows. It's nobody's business. Take care of the outside first. Okay? Take care of the outside first. Don't deal with these code enforcement officers. They are not fun to deal with. Unless you're friendly with them, you want to be very, very careful. Pull a lien search, not only a title search. Again, we talked about that. Judgments. If you are, how, oh well, no, I can't ask this question. I don't want to embarrass anyone. But if you're an investor and you have not such great credit, maybe a bankruptcy, maybe a foreclosure, maybe a car lien, maybe an IRS tax lien. How many of you want to still make money in this business if that was your case? Very good question. Individual land trusts for every single property because they're cheap and expensive, fast to set up, and you don't want to have, I had one investor that bought real estate using the same trust name. Thank God he put a different date. He would always set up his trust the same name. It was the his last name investment trust, and he bought this every property in the same name trust, but a different date. That was the only thing that saved him from a cross-contamination of a code enforcement lien on another property. That seven title companies, underwriters, and attorneys said they couldn't do, and we proved the case with the city that it's a different trust, it's a different date, it does not attach, we were able to close the deal. So again, very good question. Separate trust, name them differently. I had an investor that sent me a trust to review for him the other day. It was called the Canadian Esquire Trust or Canadian court, something to deal with an attorney in Canada. Is that really what it is? No. Name it something unique so people will get scared and run the other way. They don't want to sue. Anyone that has ESQ next to their name, don't go head to head with them, guys. It's not worth it. You're not going to win. All right, David. Why do you have all your properties in your name? you quick claim it to your trust? I would not do a quick claim. I would do a warranty deed so you, there's no question to void your title insurance policy. 
I would deed them, though, over to a land trust or something. You can call us and come in and talk to us about it. We can explain to you a little bit more. If you buy that land trust book, it'll explain to you what to do, how to do it, why to do it, and gives you all the documents. So that's the land trust in Florida by Mark Warda, W-A-R-D-A. Okay, Ben. If you have uh, multiple owners on a property, should you use just one land trust? Or, or multiple owner being the you own a property and there's multiple people that own it yes yeah I mean you can put it into a trust you can name whoever you want as trustee and the beneficiary can still stay the people that own the property now it just hides it from public record all right Alex can the trustee get a, a homestead exemption yeah that's can a trustee get a homestead on a house you live in? Yeah, there, there is a clause you can put in a deed that says as long as you are the trustee and you are the beneficiary of a house you live in, the Florida statute says you can maintain your homestead property and maintain homestead exemption. So if you open up a revocable trust, you're the trustee and you're the beneficiary because it's the house you live in, you're still retaining ownership, you still get homestead exemption. So people say, well, why would I do that? Because if I'm the same, they'll know that I own it. Yes, it's not to show people that you don't own it, it's for privacy and to avoid probing on your house you live in. So you have to be the beneficiary as well and there's a clause you can put in the deed. Oh, so I don't need a trustee no more. You would be the trustee, so it would be your name trustee of your family trust. And you would maintain homestead exemption. All right, Tom. Uh, one comment that you said about the land trust naming. Um, I saw a speaker one time. He said, "Well, maybe the Sisters of the Sacred Heart Trust." Yep. You know, uh, and uh, that'll scare you. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of places on the internet that advertise registered agent services. Would they be? You know, if they were willing to be a trustee. There are trustee. Yes, yeah, there are trustee companies. Um, I believe Mark Warda has a trustee company that he would be a trustee for trust. They just charge for it. So yes, if you're buying a lot of property and you want to keep your name completely off, you make them the trustee of the trust, unique name, and nobody will ever find you. Again, it's how, you know, I'm going to say cuckoo because I do the same thing. How cuckoo do I want to get to make sure nobody comes after me, right? How crazy. I just had a, a consult on, on the way over here with my attorney talking about the house that I own putting it in a certain type of trust and a certain name so nobody can find me. And he's like, well, why are you doing that? I said, because I'm crazy. I'm just nuts. I want to do it just because I want to do it because I know it can be done. And that's the response. Well, you don't need to do it because my homesteaded property, if something happens to me, it goes to my wife. If something happens to my wife and I, it goes to my daughter, regardless. It doesn't matter. I don't need a trust. I just want a trust because I talk so much about it. So yeah, you can do it any which way. And that book outlines the craziness that I'm talking about in a, in a pie chart, talking about husband and wife, multi-member LLC, properties, land trust, it gives you a whole graph that you can reference. Cuckoo for real estate. Cuckoo for real estate, I'm telling you. I get crazy, the more I talk about it, the crazier I am when I buy and sell real estate. Kevin, you mentioned the, uh, the LLC, and how you feel that it's not good to set it up just with one person, myself. Correct. Now my question is, What's the liability if I use a family member also put them on with my LLC? What's their liability? Their liability is that they're an owner of a company just like any other company. So they're held to the standards of what they do with the day-to-day uh, -day business of the company and what percentage they have. So yes, they're still liable. They're on the company. So my companies are typically me, 95%, and somebody else, 5%, is how I run them. Charles. Uh, two comments. One, Mark Ward's website is gulchpress.com. Hey, Gulch Press. He's written 60 books, and one of the best ones is Land, Land Trust. He's an expert. He, he is a trustee, $100 a year. And, and there you go. There's your answer. $100 a year, Tom, for Mark Ward to be a, a trustee. George. Uh, <coughs> with a trustee, he goes out of business. Well, the trustee company is typically not going to go out of business, but if the trustee were, there's typically language in the deed that says the beneficiary, if the trustee disappears or dies, there's ways to appoint what's called a successor trustee, either by providing a death certificate of the trustee, providing a signed uh, affidavit from the beneficiary appointing a successor trustee, or a resignation. So what 
in this case, if let's say Mark was to go out of business, he would tell you, I'm going out of business, we need to sign an affidavit resigning as trustee and appointing a successor trustee to now take over. That's how that would go. Okay, Andrew. Huh? Yes, a beneficiary can fire the trustee, yes. I have a home, homestead question for you. Okay. If I'm buying a property from a woman who has a property that's homestead, the husband has never lived in the property okay. and is you know, estranged, they don't even speak anymore. Is that, and the husband hasn't lived in the property, he's not on the deed, not on the mortgage, can she, some, can she be the only one who signs off, or does he have to sign off because it's homestead? We get that question all the time, and that's usually on my fraud screen, because I have a fraud screen, but I cut it out. Yes, homesteaded property, spousal interest, regardless of whether they're here or estranged, if they're legally married, they legally have to deed their spousal interest in a homesteaded property. Separation doesn't count. If they're legally married, if they're separated, it doesn't count. They have to be legally divorced in order to avoid that. All right, Kathy. Hi, um, you mentioned uh, that for the purpose of investing in real estate, it's better to set up an LLC versus, say, an S Corp. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so just write down charging order. I'm going to tell you that's the easiest way, but look up charging order. With corporations, from what I've been told and consulted on, corporations have shares which can be foreclosed on. They can be foreclosed and someone else now owns your shares. If they sue you and win, right? They now sue for the shares of the company. With an LLC, they're gonna sue your interest in the LLC, which if it's multi-member, the other person just has most of the interest. It's on what your distributions are in the, the uh, LLC. So they can't take your company and your property from you. Where a corporation, they can step in and foreclose out on your shares and now step in and run your company, take it from you. So that's why. Charging order is what you do want to look up and just read on it. There's a whole thing on it. Charging order, LLC, and it'll explain to you uh, okay. all about it. Uche. You mentioned different land trusts for each property. Yes. Is different land trusts with one multi-member LLC or a combination of different land trusts and different multi-member LLC, which can quickly get sort of expensive to keep track of from a logistical standpoint yes. and costly. Very expensive. When I bought all my first real estate, I bought them back years ago. I bought homes for $12,000. I bought a ton of them, put each one in a different LLC. The property name, so the 1234 Main Street LLC. And I bought a ton of real estate. In year one, I filed all the different tax returns and I filed all of the Sunbiz filings year one. Year two, I read the Mark Warder's book, got smart, put them all in land trust, closed all the LLCs and had one LLC, multi-member, that's the beneficiary of all of my trusts. Answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Anyone else? The books are all on my website. You can download them, titlerate.com. That's up there. Oh, you can go to Facebook and stuff and then like us and give us some testimonials. But titlerate.com is where you go to. That's our website. Not independencetitle.com because you're going to get a title company in Texas. That's not us. Titlerate.com is where you go. And you can download our books, watch our videos. There's a ton of stuff, our calculator, all of our documents, our closing cost calculator, wholesale addendums that with all the clauses that all the wholesalers use. We have an addendum with all of their stuff in one because it makes sense to, to give you that education.